This week has seen Tanzania summon the World Health Organization country representative over accusations that it withheld Ebola data. And Egypt's President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi asks global leaders at the United Nations General Assembly to intervene in the country's dam dispute with Ethiopia. This is Africa Focus. Christian women at memorial for Muslim pupils killed in fire. The pimped out Volkswagen Beetles of Ethiopia. And tourist boat capsizes in Senegal, killing at least four. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter today is Evelyn Wangui. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent this week. Seven children were killed and 64 injured when a classroom collapsed in Kenya's capital Nairobi on Monday, September 23rd. The country's Education Cabinet Secretary George Magoha said seven had been killed in the incident at Precious Talent School that occurred as the students of Class 5 and Class 8 were starting the morning lessons. He added that 64 had been taken to hospital for treatment, with two of them having serious injuries. The first floor of the building collapsed, trapping the children below. The cause was not immediately known, but authorities have previously warned 30,000 to 40,000 buildings erected without approval in Nairobi are at risk of collapsing. Hundreds of protesters gathered in central Cairo and several other Egyptian cities shouting anti-government slogans responding to an online call for demonstration against government corruption. Protests have become very rare in Egypt following a broad crackdown on dissent under President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who took power after the overthrow of the former Islamist President Mohamed Mursi in 2013 following mass protests against his reign. Security forces moved to disperse the crowds in Cairo using tear gas in at least one location. But many people stayed in the streets in the center of the capital shouting, Leave Sisi! There was a heavy traffic presence in downtown Cairo on Tahril Square where mass protests started in 2011 which toppled veteran ruler Hasni Mubarak. Thousands of volunteers wielding nets and bin bags called coasts, parks and riverbanks across the Grobe Saturday in a litter picking drive highlighting the vast quantity of trash dumped worldwide a day after mass international climate protests. Campaigners took part in World Cleanup Day from Manila to the Mediterranean as hundreds of thousands of people across the world take part in demonstrations and activities calling for urgent action on the environment. The World Cleanup Day is an initiative that had millions into the streets and cleaning up litter across the globe since it began just over a decade ago. At least four people died and three are missing after a boat carrying dozens of tourists capsized under heavy storms in Senegal. Families of the survivors waited at a hospital in Dakar as their rescued passengers spent the night on an island and were ferried back to the mainland in the morning. A boat capsized during a heavy storm in Senegal. The death toll could rise as three passengers were said to be missing after the accident. The boat was carrying several Senegalese nationals, six French people, two Germans, two Swedes and one person from Guinea-Bissau when it turned over in driving rain and a heavy swell. All the dead were Senegalese, officials and emergency services said. Two worked in a national park, one was a woman and the other victim was a child. Unfortunately with the rain, these people were trapped on site. They could not reach the island. They certainly tried, but as the sea was quite rough, they could not reach the mainland. Unfortunately, after a few attempts, their boat must have capsized. The boat was heading for the Medlin Islands, the site of an offshore national park popular with tourists who travel from Dakar, coastal capital of the Western African country. Senegalese President Macky Sall appeared for greater caution and respect for existing security norms during the rainy season in a tweet. Emergency services continued to look for those missing the following day. Distressed families were waiting on the shore to get news of their loved ones. We waited until 11 p.m. We haven't seen them. 
so we called a friend who told us that they tried to reach us. They sent a message saying that the pyro capsized around 6 p.m., that they went back to the island to sleep there because the rescue teams arrived and they gave them something to eat and to sleep. There, we learned that there was a boat sent during the night with relief supplies, food, firemen and a psychologist, and they spent the night with them. The cause of the accident were unclear. The interior minister told Senegalese media overnight that several tourists were worried about the heavy rains and wanted to return to the pier, but others wanted to stay on the boat. The survivors spent the night on the island. Blankets and food were sent to them and they were to be ferried back to the mainland in the morning. We followed the convoy and the boats to the military pier near Gori. We were able to see our friends who were on the boat. They took a bus and they found themselves here at the hospital. The rainy season arrived late this year and heavy storms have resulted in several casualties this month. Two fishermen were killed on their canoe in the same area nearly two weeks ago. A second wave of Nigerians returned to Lagos last week after fleeing a wave of deadly riots and xenophobic attacks in South Africa that mainly targeted foreign-owned businesses. The group of 314 men, women and children arrived almost 24 hours later than scheduled after reports that the South African Aviation Authority delayed issuing land permits to Airpeace, the private Nigerian airline that has been airlifting the returnees. The returnees spoke of their experience with some saying they would never return to South Africa. The return came a week after the first wave of 178 Nigerians returned to Lagos on the same airline. I don't think I were able to go back to South Africa because if you're walking the streets, you're not safe. You understand? So those people are still angry, but they're safe. So the most, what surprised me a lot, when they're the, breaking the shop, governments don't even care. They don't even like bring a police to come and uh, help the situation. So I don't think I can able to return back to South Africa. If I have a opportunity now to go back to South Africa, I can never go there for my life. Because I don't like there anymore. Like I don't like there again. They are threatening me. They want to kill me. They burn all my shop, everything, cars, everything. Look at what I am now. You understand? So I'm comfortable with this country now. My home, my country, Nigeria. I'm proud of it. At least 12 people were killed in the attacks, two of which were foreign nationals in a violence that began in Pretoria and spread to the nearby Johannesburg, as reported by international media. South Africa's MTN group and supermarket chain ShopRite have closed all stores and service centers in Nigeria after retaliatory attacks. The violence in South Africa has stoked concerns about relations between Africa's two biggest economies. They affected us because for the business, nothing is going on, nothing is moving, everything is starts, nothing is going on. Even the kids, they are staying, even they told my kids by the school that they are coming to burn them by the school. But from there, my kids, she's scared to go to school. So I, I decided, no, it's better we come back to our home. The latest wave of unrest in South Africa has raised fears of a recurrence of violence in 2015 aimed at foreigners and in which at least seven people were killed. Before that, some 60 people were killed in a wave of unrest around the country in 2008. At least 27 people, many of them children, perished in a fire at a boarding school in a suburb of the Liberian capital, Monrovia. The fire is believed to have broken out in the early hours of the morning when the Quranic school students were sleeping in a building near their mosque. In a show of solidarity, Christian Liberian women joined a memorial service at the Fish Markets Mosque in the Liberian capital, Monrovia. The Monrovia suburb of Penesville was a town in mourning as residents sought to come to terms with the loss of 27 pupils in a huge fire at a Liberian Quranic school. Only eight of the 36 people inside the building survived when the fire broke out in the early hours of Thursday, September 19th morning as the victims, who were all of Guinea origin, slept in the school dormitory. We were shocked. After our shock, then we, were, we realized how deep our grief was 
for the loss of these young children. We pray that God will sustain the families of the children and all Muslims and Liberians. Mosque officials said 27 boys aged between 10 and 20 had been killed along with one of their instructors. Six of the survivors had been allowed to return home. Two remained in hospital. Police have not ruled out any possibility as to the cause of blaze, but some locals suggested it could have been due to an electric fault. The fire broke out near the only door to the school dormitory. Join you in your mourning. We join you in comforting each other. We join you in saying, I guess the time for them was there, was reached, and no one could even stop it. No matter what we do, no matter how we love them, nothing else could be done. Several Islamic schools in Penesville City gathered at the school on Friday to offer a prayer of condolences and sympathy to the lost ones. Dozens of pupils from the nearby United Children Foundation School also came to offer their condolences and help clean around the mosque which was slightly damaged by the fire that ravaged the attacked Quranic school. We pray that what God has done for us in this period of grief will be sustained in Liberia in terms of national cohesion, in terms of the unity that we have seen despite our diversity. Guinea is a mainly Muslim nation, whereas neighboring Liberia is a majority Christian. Coming up after the break. Mexican president inspires name for Congolese migrant baby near Boda. Africa Focus will be right back. Don't touch that dial. Keep it switch. Welcome back to Africa Focus. Two years ago, the mountainous kingdom of Lesotho legalized growing medical marijuana, hoping to create jobs and raise income. Unfortunately, astronomical licensing fees have edged out local small-scale farmers, trapping some in the dangerous life of drug smuggling. Medical marijuana, a $150 billion global industry, and the small landlocked kingdom of Lesotho is hoping to get its share of the so-called green gold rush. It became the first African country to legalize the cultivation of medical cannabis in 2017, prompting companies like Medigro to set up shop just outside the capital, Masiru. Government support and great weather for growing weed makes the mountain kingdom ideal for this business. I think Lesotho is, is great in the sense that it's very untouched. Uh, so the air you breathe here is clean. The mountain air is, is amazing. You have streams and water here in abundance, which is clean. Um, and so the conditions are, 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 are favorable for, for growing cannabis, definitely. In a country with a struggling economy, medical cannabis is seen as a way to boost employment and revenue. But a license to trade legally costs about 33,000 US dollars, a price small-scale farmers just can't afford. Motiba Tamai, a fruit farmer outside Masiru, wishes he could benefit from the booming cannabis market. Most of the uh, people have been living from marijuana, but illegally. So we were hoping that this will be an opportunity for them to, to farm it uh, legally now and try to improve their lives. So if they don't uh, get that opportunity because of finance, I think it's a little bit not uh, fair for, 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 for the people. In a country where marijuana has always been traditionally cultivated, many are still forced to smuggle it across the border into South Africa. It is a dangerous activity, but my children survive because of this. They can have clothes and food but I can die from smuggling. The UN estimates that the illegal trafficking of cannabis is the third largest form of income in Lesotho over the last decade. But at this stage, legislation prioritizes foreign companies, largely excluding the local farmers from an industry expected to be worth around 270 billion US dollars in less than 10 years. 
More than 1,000 youth from the Maasai community living in Taita Taveta County over the weekend underwent a rite of passage that marked the transition from teenage to adulthood. This is one of the major cultural and traditional practices that the Maasai community has embraced to date. The Ma community is among the communities in the country popularly known for fully embracing their cultural practices, among them being the transition of young men and women to adulthood. The Maasai elders reiterate that this transition process and practice is very crucial for every Maasai Moran. <laughs> This occasional event saw the Maasai community in Taveta hold a ceremony over the weekend where a number of Morans graduated. It has a lot of benefits to, to us because we have to graduate from one level to another due to our behavior. The man who has been here, we have to behave here, so we have to go to Azima. Through sensitization, the elders stated that the community is gradually abandoning misguided traditions which were previously being practiced, especially on women, for instance, female genital mutilation. Ni mila, kama naona wasikana jatairiwa, naona kama ni sio, sio, sio mutu. Lakini kama ni miatairiwa, naona, inaona sasa nyekua mama, nyekua manamuke ya, ya kijana au ya muse. Lakini saa hii, nyekuja kubatilisha, nyekia digital, nyekua sasa watu wapaye kuna sheria ya dunia hii. Kitu muhimu, ni kwamba tamaduni hizi, zinawatarisha Mue vijana na mue wazee ambao mnaishimu utamaduni, mnaishimu sheria na pia mnaishimu serekali. Kwa hivyo, muendele hivyo hivyo. <laughs> the one of its kind event concluded with the participating Morans and elders sharing a meal with 1,500 of them graduating to adulthood. Around 80 international movies were recently screened at the third edition of El Guna Film Festival in the Egyptian Red Sea Resort of El Guna. The festival aims to showcase a wide variety of films and foster better communication between cultures through the art of filmmaking. The increasingly popular Egyptian seaside town El Guna welcomed local and international actors and directors for its third film festival. Egyptian construction tycoon and El Guna founder Sami Sawiris said the festival was proud of its key unifying theme, Cinema for Humanity. My brother Nagib had suggested from the first year that the name of the festival will be taken after the concept of Cinema of Humanity. So it's for only natural that international organizations that care about these things, such as refugees or people suffering from war, will be able to find a place here. And that is something we are honestly very happy about. The festival distributes awards for international films, short films, feature documentaries and future narratives. The more Egyptian movies contribute to festivals, the more this helps them receive international exposure. So of course, every festival helps. There's pride in the Egyptian festival, as this is an Egyptian festival. This makes us very happy. We love to take pride in our work and the work of our colleagues, especially in an honorable context such as this one. Among us, the competing movies are entrants tackling critical social and political issues such as the refugee crisis and the Sudanese revolution. One documentary by duo Omar Samra and Omar Noor, Behind the Angry Sea, documents the attempt to row across the Atlantic to draw attention to the plight of refugees fleeing conflict. The case of refugees is one that many people talk about. It's always on the news and is always received in the same ways. People have started to become desensitized to the issue. 
they don't get affected by the issue the way they should have because it happens all the time and is often viewed in the same manner. Another movie picking up traction at the festival is the Sudanese feature You Will Die at 20, which addresses issues of Sudanese hope and freedom. The festival features over 80 films and runs from September 19 to 27. Every year, the festival develops from the year before. What is new is that two years ago, it was the first time and we were a little afraid. This time, we have two years worth of experience. There's more focus on films, on workshops, and how all the artists can spend time with us and share special feeling about the festival and about Guana. There's definitely more focus on movies and workshops than last year. Volkswagen Type 1, commonly referred to as the Beetle, has long occupied a hallowed position in Ethiopian car culture, a status that reflects both economics and nostalgia. But these days, a younger generation of drivers are investing large sums to give the Beetles a 21st century upgrade. When Robel Wall bought a beat-up 1967 Volkswagen Beetle from a friend for 50,000 European beer, it marked the start of an extensive restoration He'd plotted for years. The 25-year-old Ethiopian quickly went to work. He installed new grey leather seats, applied black stripes, decals along the orange and blue exterior, and hired a metallic worker to fit oversized headlights to the front bumper. Two months later, Robel's vision was complete, and with that, he joined the growing number of young Ethiopian drivers giving the Beetle, which has long occupied hallowed position in the nation's culture, a 21st century upgrade. Yeah, Bob's I know. Volkswagen uh, Beetles. Most of the time, Volkswagen Beetles are driven by older people. But when they are customized and pimp like this, they are a fashion statement for young people. Some of this restoration work is inspired by shows like the old MTV hit Pimp My Ride, Pimped Out, American slang for customized vehicles has been adopted in Addis Ababa. Beatles became a common sight in the city under former emperor Haile Selassie, who ruled for more than four decades beginning in the 1930s. Decades later, Beatles remain abicas in part because exorbitant taxes make buying new cars impossible for many. Yet, it's clear that cars also have a sentimental value. In general, for me, this car could be for everybody. For general. Caleb Tishome, a 29-year-old mechanic, has been riding in Beatles all his life. Now, Caleb works alongside his father at the family-owned garage, where many of the Beatles have been brought in for stand-up tunes. But every few months, Caleb is asked to do the kind of custom work worthy of Pimp My Ride, a show he still watches online even though it was cancelled more than a decade ago. A lot of young people like it this way, when it's pimped. I've known these cars since my childhood. I know what they need. It could be paintwork. It could be big tires. It could be the sound system. I pimp all of it. And my customers come by if they are interested. His own pimped out Beetle, a shiny green and black 1972 model with massive tires, looks more at home on a truck. Whether pimped out or not, the Beatles of Addis Ababa seem destined to become collector's items. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you, so make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268, on Azam TV channel 138, and on Zuku channel 53. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this journey across the continent. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Keep it switch. Thank you.